Hi, thank you. Everybody can hear me? So first of all, this one will be a bit more technical than the previous one where more theoretical or philosophical. So I hope it doesn't you know, bore you too much. Uh, I'll go a bit through, you know, through code and stuff like that. All in the presentation, I won't code here. Uh, and again, ask question whenever you want. No problem. I know I'm not very famous, so a bit about myself. I've been in computers since forever. I owned my first computer in 81, so probably before some of you were born. Uh, I went through every technology you can imagine from mainframe, PCs, everything, and about three or four years ago ended up with Ruby after doing nine years of Windows and C++. And it was the best change I ever did. No more Windows. Uh, I'm a firm believer in best tool for the job, so I won't tell you that Ruby is the best uh, language to write an operating system in or the Space Shuttle control system. But I do think that it has a lot of things that it can do and web applications, stuff that relates to that. It's really the best thing I found you know, to work with. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is about multi-tenant applications. How many of you had to write multi-tenant applications? Okay, quite a few, but I see that a lot didn't yet. So what is a multi-tenant application? It's an application that supports multiple accounts or multiple clients on one system. So I run one application and I have multiple companies. For example, Basecamp is a multi-tenant application. We don't each get our own server, our own application. It's all shared. It requires a few things uh, to support it, and one is data separation, which is very critical. I don't want you to see my Basecamp clients or my, you know, my bugs in a lighthouse. It requires customization to be able to adjust it to each client, so each client can have a few different things. And it was designed to optimize resources, because if you think about it, I could take and run one server, one application for each of my clients, but I do it all in one so that I can deploy only one set of codes, I can fix the bug once, and I don't have to manage 500 servers because I have 500 customers. So that's the main idea of why we want it. When we don't want to use it, is on applications that, first of all, things like, you know, simple website. Who cares, you know, my company, public website, who cares if it's multi-tenant or not? Social networks or any other applications that uh, share, share a lot of data, that the main idea of the application is sharing data between people. We don't want to separate the data if we want to share the data. So those kind of application or applications that are mostly public, let's say a newspaper application, doesn't need to be multi-tenant. Uh, what I'll do now is we'll go through, the views have nothing to do with multi-tenant mostly, they just show the data. The controllers and the models are the important things that we need to manage in a multi-tenant application. And I'll go first on the, over the controller and then over the models of how we do multi-tenant application, what are the options. Like I said before, I, don't be, I believe in you know, many options and you need to choose the best one. I'll go over three or four options for each, and when, you know, the pros and the cons, and then whenever you need to decide it, to use it, you can decide which one is better for you. So first of all, uh, the controllers. One of the very basic things that the controller need to do is to recognize the account. Okay, who is the person that is logging in now? Do they belong to IBM or to HP? Who is they coming from because we need to show the correct data? Uh, <clears throat> there are three main ways to do it. One is domain-based, which is what uh, Basecamp uses, many, many other applications. Uh, Unfadl uses it. Uh, where we have the name of the account dot, you know, Basecamp.com. The name of the account dot app.com. The second way is URL-based, where everyone key off the same URL, but they have a different slash, the name of the company, and then the rest of the URL. So it will be, let's say, slash John slash contacts one. 
And the last one is login based, which is what I think the best uh, example will be <clears throat> the Google applications, where I don't know if any one of you set a domain for Google. If you send, you know, more.ph on Google, you go to more.ph, but then it becomes Google, and just by your login, they know you, who you are, and they separate it by the login. So the URL has no difference. It can be cookie based, it can be a session ID on the URL, but the URL itself is the same URL. After we recognize the account, we need to set the context so that the model works with the correct context. It can be current user, it can be current, <clears throat> current account, doesn't matter so much. Usually you go from the user to the account unless you do domain based on the account, the account based on the domain. And then all your data access go through the current user. So the current user contacts, current user context, and all of that. So <clears throat> how do you recognize an account from the domain? Uh, funny, because when I was writing the, the presentation, uh, DHH posted something on the 37 Signal blog exactly about that, and it's actually on uh, GitHub. Uh, and you can see the, uh, the demo, <clears throat> the code, the demo code. So what we do the, when we go into the application controller, we add a before filter. We set the current account. And if you go here, if you see the set current account here, what we do is find by the subdomain. The subdomain in red, you know, return everything but the base domain. So if you have a google.com, it will return everything else aside from google.com. So we take the subdomains and actually we take the last one. So if someone typed www.john.app.com, we'll take the John and not the www. Okay? So here we just find the account. And now we have the account, the current account set based on the domain. And if we go, for example, for the customer's controller, you see that we use, we get the customer by getting the current account customers. Okay, so everything that we, every place we access data, we access it from the current account. The current account is the key for everything and everything hangs off the current account. We'll see later in the model what we do in the model to make it work, though it's pretty standard Rails code. If you want to recognize the account from the URL, which we say app.com slash john, uh, again, there are a few ways to do it. The easiest way is using the path prefix, which is new, I think, from Rails 2.2, but maybe 2.1. So path prefix, let us prefix the old path with something else. So it can be the account name, and if we do it like that with a symbol-like thing, we can actually match it in the routes, just like any other part. So it becomes a part of the route, and the name is used there. Another way is to use resourceful one of the similar plugins that would let you actually extract the URL. By the way, it's very popular to do it in a localization where you add the, the local name in front of the rest of the URL. So you do en slash whatever or es slash whatever. Uh, it's not as clean as the others because you have to think about it. You have to put it in your routes. You have to take care of, you know, unmangling the URL. Uh, another way to do it is at the server level, do the replacement. So the server does a redirect from the slash john to john.app.com and pass this into Rails, which is another way to do it. Uh, again, it's not as clean as the others. I personally prefer not to use it this way, but if you need to, you can still do it using those tricks. Uh, recognize account from login. So when the user login, we know what the account is. There's no different URL for different companies or different accounts. And I use here uh, tracks as an example. Uh, the reason is I use this and you know, also the other thing from Git is that after the presentation you can go there, look at it and really see code working in real life. So it's all from open source stuff so you can play with it yourself. Trax uses the current user as the anchor because Trax is multi-tenant but for specific users, so it's not per company. There aren't mul multiple users per company. There is one user per account. The user is set in the session, so whenever they have to come back, you know, you, you come again with the browser, 
from the session we get the user, and everything hangs out of this user. Again, the user could be an account, or we can take the account uh, at the user, and from the user, the account. Uh, here is a way, the way it's done there. It's, uh, I cut a, lot, uh, a bit of the code so you can read it, I hope. Uh, so we have the login from cookie in the authentication system. So you log in from the cookie or you know, do the regular uh, login. Then we have the get current user, which is find the user and return the preference and the user. And again, here the preference could be account. So accounts equal you know, the user dot account and you have the access to the account. And we set the current user. So from now on, after the login, which set here the set current user, we have the current user set and it works with a global function. So anywhere we call it, we can get the current user. Uh, in the application controller, you see we use the regular login system. We have access to the current user and to the preferences. And we added the login required, which do all the login, set the current user and the preferences. And in the context controller, for example, we just do context equal current user dot context. Okay, so the current user is a global function that you can access from anywhere, and it actually accesses this internal variable, which is current user. Very similar to the other way, only we have to do the login to know where the user come from. And uh, <clears throat> other than that is uh, the same. Which one is better? There's no difference, it's all aesthetics. Some places like to have their own URL, you know, john.app.com and not go to Google. Uh, you know, the reason uh, Google did a thing where you can redirect your domain and do mail.guy.com, if you look at it, once you log in, you are at Google at gmail.com and not at your own thing, but it's a way for you to, you know, you want to send your clients to guy.app.com. Uh, there's no performance difference between them. They're all exactly the same. Uh, domain base, the one where we say john.app.com is the easiest to partition at the web server level. So if you, have to have, if you want to have multiple server, multiple app servers, it's very, very easy to partition it like that because you can send each one to a different application server, actually have multiple DNS pointing to different front-end balancers, so it's a bit easier to, to scale it. Uh, one thing to note, to note is that for SSL access, if you do domain-based, you need wildcard certificate. You cannot use regular SSL certificates because of the way web servers work. They all arrive at the same server. And the SSL <coughs> negotiation is done before we know the server name from the header. And that's why you need wildcard access. Uh, wildcard access uh, certificate don't have these nice green things they now have in the new browsers because they are not specific to a domain and an IP. Second part we have to do is the models. What do we do at the models for uh, multi-tenancy? And this is actually, I would argue, more important than the controllers because this is where we do the data separation. If we don't have the data separation, we, we failed completely at what we're doing. And <clears throat> We'll talk at three different uh, models here. One is separate DB, where each of our clients has their own database. The second is schema separation, which is uh, the less known of the method here, and I'll discuss it in more depth. Schema separation is actually built on a feature of Postgres, the Postgres database, where you can have different schema in a database and completely separate the data. It's not schema, what we call schema, the DDL of the language. It's actually a, like a namespace in the database. We'll go over it. And the last one is scoped access, which is uh, what we show in the you know, current user and stuff like that which in this mode, we hang everything out of a user. And if you think about at the SQL level, every single query you do at the end has account ID equal whatever. Okay, so end account ID equal whatever. So it's actually separated by a specific ID of the account. Separate database. The pros of it is the ultimate in data separation. There's no no chance of mixing the data because they are completely different databases. They don't have to be a different data server. They can be the same data server, but a completely different database. 
it's by design share nothing because we have a database for each client, nothing is shared, which means it's easier to vertically scale it, to do whatever you want with it. There is a very high uh, degree of failure localization by that and me, if one database is corrupted or something happened, it Im impacts a single user. The rest of the users are not impacted by the fact that my database is destroyed, so the failure is very, very localized to a specific account. It's very easy to do customizations on it because each one is a different database. Do whatever you want with the database. When you connect to the database, you get the new DDL or whatever, and you can do whatever you want with it. As long as your code can live with the different structure, there's no problem. In Rails, it's pretty easy to do because mostly the models don't care about the internal structure. The cons of separate DB is huge resource overhead. If I have to create a database for every single client, we're talking about a huge overhead. It's harder to create a new account. I have to go create a new database at the server, meaning I need super user access to create the database and uh, do all the, <clears throat> define the connection to the database and pre reload all the data. It's very hard to cache because everything is different. We cannot even, the, even the, the cache that we use in Rails internally, the small model cache cannot do all, can't do almost nothing when the connection is different and we have to reconnect. And I see something is missing, but there is a lot of uh, overhead in the connection. Both at the protocol level, I don't know if you're aware, but TCP connection handshaking is a three-phase process that takes comparatively to sending data a lot of time. And there's also all the servers, or most database servers have a high overhead in creating a connection because they have to check security, where the IP is coming from, and all the other things to set up the session. So there's a very high level of, uh, <coughs> of overhead in establishing new connections all the time. Schema separation pros. There's strong data separation. It's mostly share nothing, although there is some sharing in it, and we'll discuss it. It's almost transparent to Reds. We have to do one thing to make it work completely transparently. Uh, because of the data separation, it gives us independent account migration, so we can migrate one account by leaving the other. Uh, we have a smaller amount of uh, data to migrate when we need to migrate. It's very easy to take a legacy application that was never designed to made to be made into <coughs> multi-tenant application and make it multi-tenant. The cons is that there is some resource overhead. So for example, I wouldn't want a million uh, accounts on one database in this technique, and we'll see later why, uh, but it's not as bad as a database. The connection is the same connection. We're not doing multiple connections here. Uh, it's a bit harder to create a new account because, again, you have to generate the tables, the table uh, definition itself in each new schema you create, though there is a way to make it automatic. I prefer to just create it using SQL. I just dump the SQL in and create a new account. It needs modified migration. The regular Rails migration will not work with this way. Uh, you need, uh, I once did something called a schema iteration migration. It's a migration that iterates over the schema and change them one by one. So it's not hard to do, but it's, that it doesn't use the regular migrations. Scoped access. The pros is very low resource overhead, just uh, you know, another wear on the query. It's very natural to Rails, especially with scoping today and with uh, two, three, with the default scope, it's even easier. <clears throat> very easy to create new account. You just create an account in the table. You don't have to do anything in the data. Uh, it's very easy to do <coughs> data aggregation because if I want to count how many, use, uh, how many contacts I have all together in the system, I do one query and I get the result. If it's distributed over database, I have to connect to each different database and get it. And if it's in schema separation, I have to actually iterate over the schema, schemas and find each of it. So here the data aggregation is very simple. The cons is that the, it's a very weak data separation model. One mistake from one of the developers forgot to put the, the scope, forgot to start from the account, did something, and we can expose other people's data in our system. It's hard to migrate large data set. Imagine changing the structure of a table with 50 million records. Not a nice thing to see. Uh, especially in databases that do not support 
uh, <clears throat> acid over the DDL, like MySQL, if something fails in the middle of the migration, you might be stuck with a half done and a half not done migration. Uh, Postgres doesn't have this problem, especially since 2.2, where they use migration, they use transaction on the migration, so if it failed, it rolls back to the original uh, status. Uh, it requires sharding or partitioning if you want to scale, so at one stage the data will be too big. We will have way too much data in one table and we'll need to partition it. And it's harder to partition this way. It's not impossible, but it's a lot harder. You need to do a lot of logic behind the partitioning, deciding who, or who goes where, how to move people from place to place, and how to continue sharing the data because it wasn't designed to share between different uh, databases. Separate DB is, uh, I won't get into the details of how to do it because first of all, it's very much against the grain in Rails. To do it in Rails, it's, uh, it's hard. You need to, one of the tricks is using the magic models, but even that is not built to do 1,000 clients. 1,000 clients, 1,000 databases, it's very iffy if it will work correctly. Uh, it's a better model if you do per client MSP, what used to be called in the past, managed service providing, where you actually install an application for the user, each one gets their own server, pay the money, it's their server, and it's not really together. How we do scoped access. So scoped access is actually very, very easy. Let's say we take the class user, it has many contexts with all the <coughs> with all the regular, you know, whatever we want to do, positioning and all the rules. But as you see, it used the has many. So by default, when I access a user and I do, you know, user.context, I will get it already separated by the user because it belongs to the user and it will automatically add the where user ID equal five. We have here the belong to account. So actually I can act, extract the account from the user and everything is good. There's no, nothing else that I need to do as long as I always access through the associations in Rails. If I try to do funky things outside of that, so all kinds of queries, direct queries, stuff like that that doesn't go through here, or I go to the, to the context directly and not through the user, I might expose data. So this need to be very careful with it. I need to follow the direction all the time. Now we'll go over schema separation and because this is a bit it's a part that most people are not aware of how it works. I will go here a bit in more detail. If you have questions, just ask. And I'll use Postgres as an example, though I think that Oracle can also do the same thing and probably DB2, but let's stick to open source. What is schemas in, Pogre, in, uh, <clears throat> in Postgres? A schema in Postgres is like a directory, or if you want to do it in Rails terms, it's like a namespace. So you can have in the same you can have in the same database, the same, the same logical database, you can have multiple schemas that contain exactly the same file. So I can have the user's file in five different schemas on the same database. They're all called users, they're not called anything else. They call user, but they are completely separated because we have a namespace on top of it, which is the schema. So I can say the schema, and if I want to access it, we'll see in a second how we access them separately from each other. We can access them directly with a qualification. So we say the schema name dot table name, just like object oriented, you know, it's like, like accessing a, a member inside a class. So schema dot <coughs> the table name. But the cool thing about Postgres is that it allows us to define a search path. And a search path is very similar to an operating system search path. So let's say you can have the same file LS in five different directories, but there's a path that defines where the system looks. The first one it finds is the one it uses. Same thing with schemas. If I define a search path and the, th and the, th the system goes over the search path, wherever it finds, the first one it finds in the search path is the one it will use. So let's see here uh, an example. So we start here. We create one schema and create a second. So AAC user A, AAC user B. Then we create a table called test one with a field F1. 
it will create it in what's called the public schema. There is always a public unless someone remove it, but by default there's a public schema where everything by default goes in. Now I go and I create under AAC user one, test one, F1, fully qualified, and it created another table called test one, but if you, if you try without schema, it will sell you table already exists, right? Because the table already, have, we have a table test one. In this case, nothing happens because it's qualified by the name. The very cool thing is if, if I set the search pass to AAC user B, and now I create another table, test one, it's exactly like I created a table like here, but I didn't have to specify anything. So I just did AAC user B is this, in the search pass, I created the test, it created it here. Because this is the first schema <coughs> on, the, on the search pass. By the way, if AAC user B already had a test one, it will fail with table already exist. Okay? Now a bit more of this same magic that lets us do the rest. Okay, so <clears throat> we started by resetting the search pass. So it will be like it, the server just, you know, started. And we insert into test one, we insert two values. Those values are actually inserted into pu public test one. Then we do the same thing, but we qualify it with the schema, AAC user A. Those two values, user A1 and user A2, were actually inserted into user, account user A, AAC user A, test one. Now we insert the search path to AAC user B, and we insert again into test one. Look how this and this is exactly the same SQL. No difference in the, the same sentence exactly. But those two values will actually go into AAC user B, test one. And the nice thing, because they are all in the same database, we can actually query across, query across schemas. So if you look at it here, we did a select star from test one, union select star from AAC user A test one, and we got all of the records out. Okay, so we can do some cross schema work and we can share some of the data, but it's very easy to completely separate the data. This is, uh, how, this is all the change we need to do in Rails to actually work with this. So uh, first of all, it's just a small helper that I wrote. We actually can do without it, but it's easier with it, called Schema Utils, just a module. And what it does, it adds add a schema to the path. So I give it a schema, and it adds it to the path by executing search, search pass to this. Now this will be a call into the server, but it's actually only set for the current session. So I can have multiple people connecting to the server, each having a different search path. Okay? It's unrelated to, it's related to the specific connection and not to the whole server itself. And this is the same, just uh, reset the path back to the default in the, in the Rails uh, login, Rails uh, database YML. And in the application controller, all I do is I add a before filter set account and after filter clear account. By the way, I don't really have to do it, but I prefer to do it to catch errors if there are errors. All set account is, does is add the schema to the path by finding the subdomain. You remember the same calls that we did this subdomain before? We find the, we find the account, we, we find the DB schema of the account and add it to the schema pass. And after we finish the request, we actually reset the schema pass. The only reason we do it here is that if there is any error, there's no schema defined and nobody will see my own data. Because there's no schema defined, it will go to public, it doesn't know about my schema. If you look in the database and you ask what table they are, if you didn't set them in the search pass, there are no tables. It will say there are no tables in the database. So this is the way we do it. Uh, on the schema separation, a few things and gotchas and tips for those things. First of all, multi-threading is dangerous in this way. If you try to do schema separation with multi-threading on a connection pool, it doesn't work. I mean, it works, but you'll have bugs. 
because if one said the schema, the search path, and then another connection came in and said this, the search path on the same connection, we now have a different path. But aside from that, I personally recommend you not to do multi-threading anyway. Like I said before, I did Windows, C++ before, and I did a lot of multi-threading programming. The oddest, hardest to find bugs ever are multi-threading errors and bugs. And by the way, testing, automatic testing, doesn't catch most of those because they are very timing related, relating to million other things, exactly when the processor left your thread and went to another thread. So be careful with it, and usually you can scale and do things without the multi-threading. Migration must be schema aware. So if you do this way, you need to make your migration schema aware. It just means that before you do the migration, you have to set the schema as well. And if you have multiple schemas, you just have to iterate over all the schemas and run the migration for each of the, of the schemas that you have. Site creation is best with a SQL file in my, you know, because you need to create it with just what we do when we change the schema, we dump a file with the system and then we just load the SQL back into the new schema and it create it. Uh, and other things that related to everything, not to this, anything that works on recognizing by account is you need to be aware of the TLD because the Rails way of doing it, it takes into account, when you do the subdomain in Rails, it takes into account only two parts in the TLD, in the top 11 domain, so it's only .com. So google.com will be the domain and the rest will be the subdomain. But if you have google.co.uk, you'll get co.uk as the domain and Google will be part of the subdomain. So whenever you do something like that, be careful with it and either pass in the, you know, the size of the domain, the size of the TLD, or just you know, plan for it beforehand. And one thing about caching, if you do caching, you need to include the account again in all of them because you don't want to return contact one of one user as contact one of another user. The account, must, account or user must be taken into account when caching. Always remember this. You cannot cache regularly because you will again mix data. And that's the end, and I'm open for questions. Yes? What database were you using there? Postgres. Yeah, this works in Postgres or any other systems that support schemas or some other way of namespacing. It doesn't work on MySQL. Yes? I just want a big plus one on using schemas for things. Like, if you haven't heard of it before, let your mind wander without using schemas. <laughs> and one thing is that, first of all, I would tell you use Postgres for everything you do and not MySQL, but uh, if you use it and you want to learn, the Postgres documentation is very, very good. The schema documentation is really good. All of it, even just for learning, learning SQL, is a very, very good uh, place to do is in the Postgres documentation and the Postgres uh, mailing list and forums are very, very, very good. The actual all the developers of Postgres answer questions of newbies in the mailing list. More questions? Yes. You said that um, uh, for the schema separation that the migrations won't work out of the box. Um, I can't remember if you covered that or not. Is it like a plugin or anything to help you with that? I don't know what you need it. Shoot me an email and I'll show you. It's, it's really, really easy. There's an, almost nothing to it. And uh, again, in Postgres, it's nice because they are transaction aware. So if the schema didn't, if the migration didn't complete, it will roll back to the original without leaving you with half a migration done. The public schema affects all of the sub-schemas. Actually, it doesn't affect. It's just an, it's, there's no difference between the public and the rest, aside from the fact that by default it's there. I know of people that actually delete it. Delete this. It's, it's just as a regular schema, but if you do a regular Rails application and you go and create, you run the migration, it will create everything in public, unless you did something not to do it. One of the tricks of doing with, the, with this is that usually the user or the accounts will sit in the public schema. So whenever you go to, the, to do the, 
the initial part of the login and all that, you do it on the central schema on the public, and then you go and work with the others. If the user file appear or the account file appear only in the public, even if you set the search bus, as long as public is there, you will see it. So Rails will see it. It doesn't even know it's in a different schema. Rails is completely unaware of it. That's why it allows us to do it, because once we set it at the level of the, of the, of the database server, Rails is completely unaware of what's going on below it. And it will let you do whatever you want. And that's why I said in the beginning, it's easy to take an existing application. Uh, <clears throat> let's say you have some contact managers that you want to make it multi-tenant. By using schema separation, you don't have to write to change a single thing in your code. Even if you didn't do scoping by user and all that, just take it, put it on a different schema, and it's multi-tenant. Other questions? Okay. Thank you.